Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I am the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. I'm also the creator of the Teach the Geek to Speak online public speaking course. You can go check it out at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Today, my guest is Manjula Selvaraja. She is a journalist and columnist on technology and education. She even worked for a time in marketing, but it all started with an engineering degree. So I'm really curious to find out how an engineer went to journalism, how her engineering background benefits her current work, and when she realized public speaking could be of use to her. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Manjula. Hello. Nice to, thank you for having me here. It's really nice to be here. Oh, so I mentioned in the intro that you started off in engineering, and I saw from the bit of research I did on you that you got a degree in mechanical engineering. What promoted you to get that degree? So there, there's a, a little bit of a story uh, with this. When I was, um, so I uh, grew up in Nigeria, uh, in Nigeria, West Africa. And when I was little, um, I was in school and we had a teacher that would teach us electronics. I showed up, it was our first class in electronics, came and drew this picture of how a motor worked. And no one understood it because it was this 2D picture with chalk on the board. So I went home and my dad was an accountant, but I was complaining to my dad. I said, oh, I, I think I'm gonna do really badly in the course. I don't understand how a motor works. You know, If electricity goes through, why does this thing turn around? It makes no sense. He goes, oh, I'll show you. And then we built, he just got a bunch of wires and a battery and, and, and connected them. And we didn't get a fully functioning motor, but we saw that little thing move slightly. And it blew my mind, Neil. I thought, oh my goodness, I can't, I really can't believe this is what it looks like and this is how it works. And, and I ended up being then the kid that, that would explain this to everyone else, which I never saw myself as being. I never saw myself as being someone who could be good at things like physics or electronics, but I became the person that, that, that would teach the rest of the class these things. And I think that confidence um, then, then that actually started showing up in my academic work and started opening up all these career possibilities too. So when one of my cousins said, oh, I'm studying engineering, when I heard that, what I heard was that, oh, perhaps I could do that too. Um, I could perhaps become an aeronautical engineer or a marine engineer or, or something that has to do with all of those things that are that are physical, that are amazing, that work with this kind of scientific magic. And I could do more of that. And uh, and that's why I went into engineering. OK, that's pretty cool. So then you get this engineering degree. What type of work did you do once you got your degree? So right when I got out, I, uh, I was part of, you know, the other thing that I recommend to people that are in um, colleges or universities that are doing degrees of this kind is get involved with conferences and, um, and other initiatives of, of that kind that bring speakers and bring other sort of engineering graduates to the school because you can form relationships with them. And I was working, um, recruiting speakers for a student conference in engineering and met a couple of people that worked at AT&T. Um, they must have sort of liked working with me because a couple of weeks later they said, why don't you just come for a visit into the office? And I didn't realize this when I showed up, it became a series of interviews. And so I ended up in telecom. Um, so I was doing, um, working on capital finance and telecom. And from there, I moved into doing consulting in telecom. And from consulting in telecom, I moved into software because that was around the time that all of these startups and, and software companies, really interesting small software co companies started emerging. And that's where I ended up um, uh, in software and software marketing. Wow. So all the all the work it seems you've done. I mean, I'm trying to see the the link between mechanical engineering and software and, and and marketing and all these other things, but I'm kind of having a little bit of difficulty doing that. Did you kind of stumble? I guess if another company had approached you as opposed to AT and T, is it possible that you would have ended up working in a completely different industry? I think so because the time that I that I um, when I graduated we were in the middle of a mini recession and you know the class before us had struggled to get jobs um 
And I think what was happening is when you graduate from engineering, especially, especially mechanical engineering, it forms a foundation for you, right? You could go out with that and do anything. So when I look at my, my class, there were people that became, uh, went on to get a law degree, people that went on to get an MBA and went into finance, people that went on to work in, in coding. So when you come out with, an, with that kind of a mechanical engineering, it's that foundation. And I think where I found myself in my last year is, oh, I don't think I'm going to become an aeronautical engineer. There are not a lot of jobs in that field. That's what I came into engineering to do. What am I going to do now? And all of these speakers that are coming in are all coming with all kinds of, you know, we had, I think a couple of weeks before that, we had someone from Deloitte and Touche that was doing management consulting. Like it seemed like the engineering degree was like getting your life sciences degree where you could become a pharmacist, an optometrist, a researcher, or a scientist. You could do all of these things, right? So you're absolutely right. I think if I had recruited another speaker who had come in and said, I'm here from a management consulting firm. We seem to be working really well together. Do you want to come for a tour of the office? And I'd gone for that tour of the office and been impressed with what I, what I saw. I think I would have ended up there. But one of the threads that I've all, always followed in my career is I've always, um, it started out as something that I ended up with. And then it started up, then it started being something that I would actively look for. So when I look at those first series of jobs, I seem to be drawn to people that were intelligent, the people that just seemed to be real thinkers and doing intelligent work more than the actual product or more than the actual um, service that they were selling. And I would say that my first two jobs were that and then it became you know when I went into software when it when I went into even the particular roles that I chose in journalism journalism was always am I being interviewed by people and will I be working with a team of people that are far more smarter than me let's just put aside the show they're on let's put aside the product that they're coding the service that they're selling um, are these people smarter than me and I just, I found myself um, that I do really great work and my career goes places when I'm surrounded by people like that. So I would say that that was the constant threat that I didn't actively look for, but happened to be attracted to at the start. And then once I figured that out, now when I go into an interview, when I look, if I, if not that I am right now, but if I happen to, that is what I specifically look for is, is super smart people doing smart things. You know, it, when you were when you were talking, Angela, it made me re remember when I came out of school. Maybe it was a couple of years after the whole dot com bust. So a lot of people that I remember the, that were just a couple of years ahead of me in school that they were having, they were getting jobs, and they were and we were everybody was so happy about them getting this job, and then a couple, few months later, their jobs are getting rescinded. <laughs> so yeah. they they didn't have any jobs themselves. So luckily. At least by the time I came around, some of that kind of had, had gone away. Although I will say also at the time when I graduated, I, I went to grad school afterwards. So it wasn't like I was looking for a job at the time anyway. So who knows? Maybe it wasn't as, as rosy as I remember it to as I remember it being. But yeah, I, I definitely can can recall people having issues getting getting jobs coming out of school. So it's so you've taken a very interesting path, Angela. I said in the in the intro that you you work as a journalist now. So when you think of someone who has a mechanical engineering degree, you don't necessarily think journalism. So what made you go into journalism? It was interesting because one of the top shows in Canada, radio shows in Canada, um, is actually hosted by someone who studied engineering as well. So so maybe it's a theme. Um, uh, so. What happened while I was working, um, so I was working, um, doing marketing, heading the marketing department at a software startup in Toronto, a job that I loved. I'd been doing it. Um, it was one of those companies that wasn't like a, you know, 
uh, overnight success. It had been sort of humming along slowly. I think we were in our eighth or 10th year by that point. The company eventually went on to IPO and, and was bought by Oracle, but we were in the 10th year. Uh, and I just had this, this, this um, a personal situation where I was ready to start a family. I'm being very honest here, Neil, but my husband and I were having um, fertility issues and, you know, two and two together. And my, and, you know, uh, medical advice I got was that the lifestyle I was leading at that point, because early startups can be a tremendous amount of work, a tremendous amount of hours, and sometimes stress that may not even be visible to you. And even though I was with a very, really supportive uh, management team, uh, I just, this was a priority to me. So I took some time off to start my family. And then I had this really strange experience. Um, so, so here I was taking a break from a job that I loved, imagining that possibly I would come back to, to you know, continue on this career path where, you know, I, I was a VP of marketing at that point. Maybe a couple of years later, I could become a CMO at a tech firm. That would have been the career path for me. So I took a break, promptly something like uh, eight or nine months after um, I started that break, uh, you know, within the two years, I, I had a child and I was raising that child. And in that time, while I was pregnant and, uh, and also in that first year of, of looking after my, my little one, I started uh, offering my marketing expertise pro bono to, to nonprofits in, in Toronto that were in my community. So I am Tamil, I'm from a country called Sri Lanka, which is off the, the tip of India, which had for years been going through a conflict between, um, between the government and a minority group that lived in the country. And there were, you know, all sorts of human rights issues that were going on and, and, and issues of, of uh, that had created a wave of refugees. So I just offered my services. I said, if you need someone to write your press release, I'll just do it in the background. When I have time in between, you know, a feeding and a diaper change, whatever it is. And it just so happened that there were these four days that, that shifted my perspective on things off the coast of BC, there was a, a boat of migrants who were Tamil that appeared. It was a boat of people that were fleeing this conflict. And the rhetoric in the media at that point was very much like, oh, they're just a bunch of terrorists. No one even knew who was exactly on board. We were just told that they were Tamil migrants, but the rhetoric was that they were terrorists. And I got pulled because of a lack of resources in the in the community here to go on air to just say not to defend these people, but to say, since we don't know who's on the boat, could we at least just give them the benefit of the doubt? Just let's call them migrants till we hear their story. In those four days, I think I did 40 interviews. And what I found interesting is I know sometimes that the journalists that work across major and minor media outlets um, get characterized as being biased and unknowledgeable. What I found is that these were people who came into the story, parachuted into the story with such little information. Some people didn't even know where this country was. And very quickly, within like six hours on the first day, they knew a tremendous amount. They were asking me really insightful questions. And what I also noted was a lack of diversity in the people that I met, even though I was impressed with the work that they did and who I met. So in those four days, I came to respect the trade of journalism. And I, someone, one of those journalists said, oh, it's interesting that you're sitting across from me. Have you ever considered becoming a journalist? And that was the conversation. I went off then, did my research, and I thought, I think I want to be able to tell stories of this kind um, from, the, from the other side and, and possibly bring more representation to media, but also to the coverage that we do in Canada. And that's how I ended up on the other end. And I'll tell you, you might think that engineering can't prepare you for a role like that. Engineering prepares you for a lot of things and journalism can be one of those things as well. Wow. So it seems like in, in a couple of instances, it just happened to be uh, you meeting with someone, somebody to kind of 
change the trajectory of your whole working life. At first, it was the it was the people at AT and T, and now it's the these reporter people. I mean, if you hadn't have met any of these people, I mean, what would Manjula be doing now? I mean, who knows? <laughs> but it's just, it's just it's funny how life works out sometimes, and you just totally. and you just you, you go down these paths that you did not foresee for yourself, maybe even a year or two before they actually happen. So this is a really interesting interesting take, and and so interesting in fact that you still are doing journalism. You never went back to to marketing or to engineering. I mean, what is it about journalism that's really fueling, I guess, your des your desire to continue on with it? So the 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 one thing I'll add, just to add to a point to what you said, is that I've met a lot of people that have suggested ideas to me. Like people suggest things like, "Oh, you should think of being a school board trustee," or "You should think of starting a negotiation, you know, consulting firm." Where I, I get all sorts of ideas uh, tossed at me. So. You know, the thing I want to point out is be open to listening to ideas till you find the one that resonates. So it wasn't just that the AT&T conversation or the per, or the man who met me at a at a friend's dinner party who, who said, would you come into for an interview with my software startup or that journalist who told me during those four days, they weren't just the only conversations I, I was hearing. I was hearing a lot of ideas, but those sounded compelling to me. So I would say, listen, but also have a filter that allows you to say, does what you're proposing meet my values and work for me and my skills? So be, you know, don't just listen to everything that every conversation that you have. So coming back to journalism, you know, um, and there's never, I, I'm not going to say that I won't go back to tech. And I'm also not going to say that I'm going to leave or stay in journalism. I don't know. But the thing is that I have now these two paths open to me. But what is incredibly compelling about journalism is that you feel that you are doing a service. Um, and the, the, the second thing is you learn a lot uh, about a lot of things. I, you know, just through the course of today, I have listened to and read a tremendous amount of information on Russia and Ukraine. I have read and researched a tremendous amount uh, of information on, on people creating memorials in, in uh, someone created a, a, a memorial for Brianna Tra Taylor in the metaverse. So I've read about that whole trend and it's super powerful. Look at those two things, they're so opposite. So you can go really profoundly into these things. And the third thing that I will say is that I have interviewed people on, on when they are experiencing the best moment of their life and when they're experiencing the worst moment of their life. And the lessons that you learn at, at someone's high point and someone's low point are so profound that that it's that I can't I just saying that to you Neil I don't have to say anything more you understand the wealth of of insights and the emotional journey that you take with people when you speak to them here and you speak to them there so I've spoken to people that have have lost a child I've spoken to people that have won an unremarkable, like an incredible scholarship to something. And that is the journey. And I, and, and I consider it such a privilege to be able to speak to people at those points and everything in between. So I actually consider being a journalist an incredible privilege. Nice. And, you, yeah, I think, and you're right. I do understand where you're coming from. But even if I didn't, I, I, I wouldn't say it on camera. I, I probably played it off. <laughs> That's an interesting comment. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Then off camera, like, I had no clue what you were saying back then. But uh, <laughs> hey, tell me, does that make sense no, to you? No, it, absolutely, yeah. it absolutely makes sense. And then that's the answer I'm sticking with. So, you know, so you're, you're, you work as a journalist and it's, and it's interesting work. But, and, and I'm sure as, as part of your job as a journalist, it's, it's has, you have to, to be able to to talk to people, you gotta be skilled at talking to, to people in, in, in various capacities. Is is, 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 is is talking to others, communicating with others something you've always been good at? And if not, what'd you do to get better at it? So no, it's it's not something that I've always been good at. Um, you know, specifically, I remember back to this one key presentation I did 
when I was working at the software startup, we had a, I had to do a presentation to a, a massive business partner. And I, I was nervous, I stumbled, I, I had this beautiful presentation of slides and it was such a mess. And I remember my CEO who was a mentor um, said to me, that was really bad. <laughs> Actually, I think he might've used the word horrible. Uh, that was really bad, but it's something that you can work on, right? And that's the great thing, you know, and, and you know, I've been watching a couple of uh, the, the interviews that you've done and the lesson, I love that the lesson that comes through and it's something that, that I feel that you believe in, um, which is why I really wanted to speak to you as well, is this idea that this is not rocket science. The only thing probably that is rocket science is actually rocket science. This is something that you can totally learn. And, you know, I went from a, a stage where I would be, you know, getting ready to do talks or presentations, which you have to do when you when you work for for startups. And I would be nervous. I would be in the washroom nauseous. I couldn't eat to a point now where where I feel super comfortable. And um, and one of the key ways that I that I did that is by starting very small, is learning to speak in a lot of small venues. So if that could be as small as asking questions at meetings, um, that could be as small as saying, I will make the toast at my aunt's 50th. And I would only say one line like, I'm so happy you're in my life. And that's it. But you start really small. And then you start saying yes to things. And don't be afraid to fail. But I think a lot of speaking is not about People think about things like getting rid of the ums and the ahs and, and, and look at me, I don't sound polished. I'm all over the place with you, Neil, right? But it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. What you have to work on is just getting your point across. So what I would recommend to people is, is, is I think that the journey I took worked for me is starting really small and work on your confidence with those small things. And, and keep saying yes till you're ultra comfortable doing doing the bigger things. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with you there. And, and I think you're right. I mean, the, I think this interview is going great so far. And, and I certainly, but then again, I certainly wouldn't tell you to your face. I, I, I would like to do that. <laughs> I do it behind your back like a gentleman. You know, okay. that, that's, 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 that's what I do. <laughs> and I think it's kind of funny if the toast would have been, I'm so happy you're in your life. Hopefully that boss that you had, and you know, that CEO boss that you had, wasn't there because then he'd say that was terrible. I think that's not a toast. <laughs> you can go with that damn sentence. <laughs> exactly. But you know what? Sometimes, sometimes there's a way, like the where there's a way that you give feedback. And I love that you said that about do it in one-to-ones, which is what he did. And what he also said is he was frank. That was horrible. Everyone knew it was horrible. I knew it was horrible. And he said it. He didn't, you know, say, well, and he said, but we can change this. And let me talk to you about some strategies of how you can better get better at it. And that's how you do. That's how you give feedback. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I fully agree with you there, Manjula. But, you know, but, you know, it just depends on who's receiving that feedback. I mean, you could have been someone who, if he had told you that was horrible, you could have just just shut it down right away. Like you didn't want to hear nothing after that. You, you're supposed to tell me something good before you tell me it was horrible. You, you can't just leave with it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, don't ever do that to anyone. Oh my gosh, don't ever do that to anyone. If you cannot provide um, that cushion of kindness, I, I really be cautious about providing feedback because you know we are, we've been living through a pandemic, especially now. We've been going through all sorts of things in the world. Um, you know, yeah, it, it's like NPR says, we don't, they interview with, with some level of compassion, not with ruthlessness. So you should do that with your feedback too. You're there to grow people. Yeah. You got to start with a little bit of sugar before you give them any of the, of the vinegar. Absolutely. Cause you start with that vinegar. It's just, I know I, I, I ain't done with this. <laughs> I don't care what you got to say after this. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so when it comes to the, the work that, or I guess presentations that you have to do the any kind of communication that you have to do in front of others, do you have a, a process for putting it together? And if so, what is it? So that's, that's a very good question. So, um, you know, right now I'm in the process of working with a production team to meet, uh, to 
create a podcast. I prepare for talks like talks with you. And I also have um, live, uh, you know, live hits that I do on the media outlet that I work for. So one of the things that I would say is that I prepare incredibly, like I do a significant amount of preparation for them. And pretty much here we're having a conversation, but pretty much for everything that I do, I word for word, write everything that I have to do. So if I have to make a speech, even the good morning, how are you? I just want to point out to you where the washrooms are in this room. Remember to tell, to, you know, turn your cell phones off. Everything is written word for word. It's called scripting. And the reason that you do that is if you're having a bad day, if you're not feeling that energy that day, turn to your script, right? And if you work out on a, if you detail a script, your brain remembers it better. So I, so I, I do my research. I write a detailed script. I have my mouth exercises that I do, you know, the ah, e, I, O, U, loud in a room. And it sounds like an ah, say it really loud to widen yourself, crunch an apple, drink some hot herbal tea, bend over. I'm going to do this right now. It's going to look strange, but you got to and shake yourself off because you need to loosen yourself and take up space, right? <laughs> and um, and then do the best that you can. I know this all sounds strange, Neil, but this is how you prep yourself. But I would say that so that you remember that, I actually have a checklist on a sheet that I do. And every time about I'm about to make a talk, the morning of, I make a copy of it and I go and check. Cup of tea, yes. Wi-Fi, check. Script done, research done. Have I done my my exercises? Yes. And it's like it mentally prepares you ready to do this talk. So did I do all of those weird exercises before I'm speaking to you? Yeah. Did it look funny? Absolutely. But I was in a quiet room doing it, so no one saw it. So they okay. So yeah, I, I was about to say, I mean, hopefully you're doing this by yourself. Because if I know if you if you're just, just in a room crunching or eating an apple. While, while, while pronouncing all your vowels, while bent over shaking, I mean, people are gonna think you're nuts. <laughs> this is the person that we have to listen to right now? <laughs> I don't know, yes. I don't know about yes. this. Run it, yes, run into a private room to do it. But yeah, but but I think I think the research is also super important because you're, it's the amount of respect that you have. The, one other little thing that I will tell you is, um, you know, when you are in a room and you're about to make a talk, take a breath, scan, and tell yourself that you own the seat and you own this podium and, and that no one would have invited you to do this if they didn't go through the filters of thinking that you should be there and then just go for it. I do, because if you question yourself, why you, you don't have to do any of that. No one invites you to that podium if they didn't always already go through the audition in their head. So all you have to do is deliver when you're there. Yeah, I, I fully agree. And then if you do all of that, then you won't have somebody coming up to you afterwards saying that was horrible, like your CEO did all those years ago. <laughs> yes. Well, this has been great talking to you, Mangela. Thank you so much for being a guest. How can people get in touch with you? Oh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Please reach out. And if at any point you just need a little pep talk, I love giving pep talks, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm happy to point you to resources too. So you can get better at, at speaking. This is one of them. And then um, you can find me on Twitter at Manja Selva, M-A-N-J-A. S-E-L-V-A, and please speak and talk more. I, I want to hear a lot more opinions and voices out there. Excellent. Well, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson, founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online, pro, uh, online platform for science and engineering professionals. I'm also the creator of the Teach the Geek to Speak online public speaking course, and you can find out all about it at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Angela. Thank you.